Well, I remember when I first heard about him, it's when he uh, got out of the Hanoi Hilton in 1973. America immediately was introduced to this extraordinary hero. John and I went to the Hanoi Hilton together. And what's left of it, there's only part of it left. But John's cell is still there. It was really a very emotional moment. He had courage, obviously, in the military. But he showed the same courage here in the, in the Congress. John and I came to the House of Representatives together in 1982. And John, because of his background, stood out above everyone else. But John and I had differences a lot of time. We, neither of us were shrinking violets. Half-baked, spurious nationalism. He was a, a very effective, articulate, strong spokesperson for his point of view. He's pretty much a contrarian in a lot of ways. I mean, this is a man who doesn't suffer fools gladly and who has a temper. And I'm sick and tired of you denigrating mine and many other people's who happen to have different views than yours. Almost everyone in the Republican conference in the Senate has had what we call a McCain moment, where John blew his top over one thing or another. But you could anticipate within the next few days he would come up and apologize. John McCain would just constantly tease me behind closed doors, and frankly, not always behind closed doors, sometimes right out there in front of a bunch of people. And finally, Lindsay came over to me and he said, you know, Elizabeth, he said, John wouldn't tease you if he didn't like you. What people will up and don't know and don't see is the compassionate side of John McCain. Being a patriot, uh, being someone who cares deeply about our men, men and women in uniform, making sure they have what it is they need. Um, uh, that's just, that's John McCain. I've met some great senators in the years I've been here, but you meet very few truly great men in the traditional sense. He's one of them. Thank you, fellow senators. Mr. President, I yield the floor. John and I both had the same view that the war in Vietnam had been too divisive, uh, that it had been um, r r rather badly managed. I think that, that both of us felt that the divisions that had so d grabbed the country and created uh, this, this polarization and anger uh, needed to be addressed. The, the, we needed to try to find a way to actually not just make peace over there, but make peace here. That America needed to be at peace about the war. And so that's when we set out to work on the POW MIA issue because we had a fundamental responsibility, particularly those of us who'd served, to make sure we were trying to get the answers and trying to find out if it's true. And if it was true, then we had to keep faith with the uh, with the adage that, you know, you never leave anybody behind. Uh, so it was critical for us to go at that. And John, that's where a bipartisan approach really was so key, uh, that, that, that we were together able to try to uh, find the evidence, follow the evidence, uh, make sure that no stone was unturned in the effort to be able to answer those questions to the families to the loved ones who, who never had closure. When we first came to the Senate, everybody did that. You, you stepped across the aisle because that's how you got things done in the United States Senate. And it was not polarized the way it is today. So people found partners. And obviously, in bipartisanship, you needed to have partners on the other side of the aisle to make things work. So they did it, we did it, people did it in the course of business. I think what began to separate John out was that once the polarization began to come and once you had this, this sort of orthodoxy that was being put in place by the caucus, uh, then John was willing to step out and not be stuck. And every American should be very, very proud of the fact that we continue today to try to bring that, that moment of closure to families and repatriate remains. Uh, even even to this moment in 2018, uh, we are 
We are laying people to rest whose, whose remains come back uh, who were killed in 1966 or 7 or 8 or 9, 70. I mean, it's quite extraordinary. Um, and, and at one moment, John and I w went to the Hanoi Hilton together, and, and it was pretty remarkable to have a personal tour of the Hanoi Hilton, what's left of it. There's only part of it left. But John's cell is still there. And John and I went into his cell and stood there together, and it was, uh, it was really a very emotional moment. Everybody knows that John McCain is very funny, that he's irreverent, that he's very smart, and he's very knowledgeable. What people often don't know and don't see is the compassionate side of John McCain. I remember once talking to him after he had returned from a visit to Walter Reed Hospital. And as he was describing one of the severely wounded service members with whom he had visited, his eyes started to well up. And that's the compassionate side of John that oftentimes is hidden from the public, but it's very much a part of who he is. I don't think there's anyone who has served in the Senate during my 21 years here who knows more about national defense, about our military, about what it's like uh, to be deployed in difficult situations, and of course about what it's like to be a prisoner of war than John McCain. He has an enormous wealth of knowledge and direct understanding and compassion for the men and women who are serving in our armed forces. I remember uh, several years ago when John's flight to Halifax for a national security conference was diverted to Bangor, Maine, and that's where I live. And just at that time, a plane full of troops from overseas was about to land. And it was the first American soil that they would touch after their long deployments overseas. And of course, he delayed his departure to Halifax so that he could greet every single person who got off that plane. And that was typical of John. He delayed his own departure in order to make the day of all of these troops returning from Iraq or Afghanistan. I met Senator McCain when I was in the House on a conference committee and immediately you knew this is a guy who said just what he thought. So many politicians these days, you know, they have to be careful and this, that and the other thing. McCain had the confidence and conviction to speak his mind on just about every kind of issue. If somebody offered an amendment that most people would roll their eyes at but smile, he'd say, this is a lot of junk, this is a lot of hokum. The word I would most associate with John McCain is courage. He had courage, obviously, in the military, but he showed the same courage here in the, in the Congress. From the very days he got to Congress, he was not one of these people who only cared about his district or his state. He cared about the world and the United States' place in the world. That led him to be such a defender of the military, but it also led him to take on issues where the United States was hurting itself, such as torture. He always had the back of our men and women in the military, but again, his courage shined through. That didn't mean he would just listen to what the general said was good for the military. Given his experience, given his depth of knowledge, when someone came in with something that he thought was not very good for the soldiers, whether they were a four-star general or the head of a defense company or a colleague, he'd say, I'm not doing this because this is not good for the men and women fighting for us. That was his lodestar. That was his north star. His north star was protecting the men and women who served us and making sure the Congress did it, and he'd take on anybody who he thought got in the way. That thumbs down could sum up his entire career. I spent a lot of time talking to John McCain in the days leading up to that, we were very close, and I knew what would happen. John McCain, again, would do what he thought was the right thing, no matter what the pressure. That was his hallmark. I've met some great senators in the years I've been here, 
but you meet very few truly great men in the traditional sense. One was Ted Kennedy, another is John McCain. But very few, he's one of them. Oh, he's a hero. Feisty, strong opinions, outspoken, widely respected, well-loved, and uh, a remarkable American. I first met him in Congress when he came to the Senate in 1986. He was across the hall. Since we were rookies then, um, we teamed up on things. For example, the softball team. We called it the MAC team. Uh, subsequently, our relationship devolved into a bitter argument over campaign finance reform and the First Amendment and political speech leading to a, a decade of back and forth on different sides of that issue. Uh, ultimately, he won in, in um, Congress. President Bush signed McCain-Feingold and uh, I immediately took it to court. So I was the plaintiff in the uh, Supreme Court case of McConnell versus FEC. Uh, he won again. So I called him up the day after and I said, uh, it's been a great, great fight. We had a lot of passionate arguments. He won, I lost. <laughs> he, was, he was very gracious. And then of course he was running for president during those years as well. Nobody thought he had a chance. I mean, he was carrying his own bag through airports to get on you know, commercial flights and amazingly, he sort of came from behind and ended up being uh, the nominee in a very bad year for Republicans. I don't think if we had nominated uh, Dwight Eisenhower, we could have won in 2008. You know, John could have uh, left the playing field. But he came back to the Senate and doubled down and continued to make an extraordinary contribution. We thought of him as kind of our shadow Secretary of State or Secretary of Defense. He, was off, gosh, one weekend a month going to some place in the world, and it was not anything fancy like the Paris Air Show. I mean, he was going to Afghanistan, Ukraine, meeting with freedom fighters in Syria. I never went on a foreign trip with John, but those who did said every time uh, there was an opportunity for service people to meet him, he was like a rock star. John was never um, one... <laughs> not to have an opinion, and sometimes expressed it very forcefully, and was, in my judgment, almost always right. Um, not every time. He certainly wasn't right on campaign finance reform. <laughs> well, he's pretty much a contrarian in a lot of ways. I mean, this is a man who doesn't suffer fools gladly and who has a temper. Uh, almost everyone in the Republican conference in the Senate has had what we call a McCain moment you know, where John blew his top over one thing or another, but you could anticipate within the next few days he would come up and apologize. But he also had a wicked sense of humor. You know, he could uh, take a tense moment and make everybody laugh, and frequently did that. I remember one time, it, it wasn't so much laughter. We had just uh, had the big Obamacare debate. It was Christmas Eve, and our side, of course, was very much against uh, the proposal, and we lost. But there was a, uh, a great sense of camaraderie, even in defeat. And McCain got up at lunch and told the story of the time um, when he was in the Hanoi Hilton, when he was taken out of his cage outside, thinking maybe this was going to be his last breath, and the um, uh, the Vietnamese guard took his shoe and did a cross in the ground, drew a cross, thereby letting him know it was Christmas. And um, that was not a moment for laughter, but a moment for, um, it was kind of a tearful moment of um, exhilaration that we had, you know, fought the good fight and uh, come up short, but we were all uh, closer brothers as a result of it. It's hard to imagine um, a more extraordinary life than he's led or a more significant contribution he's made to his country. John and I came to the House of Representatives together in 1982. We had a very large Democratic class 
and a relatively small Republican class. And John, because of his background, stood out uh, above everyone else. And um, he and I weren't buddies, you know, in the House, such a large body, 435 members. You really have trouble getting to know all the Democrats well, let alone the Republicans. And you only get to know Democrats well if they're on the right committees with you, and the same with Republicans. So John and I weren't pals, but of course everyone knew of John McCain during the four years we spent together in the House. I wish it were only one occasion that John and I had differences, but we had a lot of differences. We spent 34 years together in the Congress, and John McCain isn't somebody that uh, didn't feel strongly about issues. I felt strongly about issues. And he and I mixed it up a few times. But in spite of all that, John and I bonded a long time ago. Uh, I admire him then, I admire him now. He's a man who has a very, very hot temper. I've had him jump on me. But the good thing about John McCain, that temper doesn't last very long. I went to John once. I said, John, if we had a joint caucus, we won't talk about politics. Would you be good enough to take that hour we're going to have having lunch together and talk about Vietnam? He said, yeah, I'll do that because he had never done it before. A lot of senators came after he and I came to the Senate. They, they didn't know much about John McCain. So we had that lunch. And of all the experiences I've had with John McCain, that's one I will never, ever forget. He stood there, as hard as it was, recounting the torture of him and others how, with tears in his eyes, and they ran down his face, how this strong, strong man felt so bad because the Vietnamese tortured him for so long, he said things he wished he hadn't said. I'll never forget that. That took courage to do that. He could have come in and told us anything, but he came in, typical for McCain, and he told the truth. When Wall Street collapsed, he and Obama were running for president. Try that one on for a little drama. We had a meeting in the White House with President Bush, and they were there, both in the trenches running for president. I can remember that meeting. It was a very difficult meeting. And maybe Barack Obama may not understand this, but John McCain appreciates Barack Obama. He knows about the election. He knows how hard it was. <clears throat> but he also knows that Obama is a good person. McCain's a good person. I have on the Senate floor, not once, not twice, but numerous times, referred to John McCain as a hero. I don't know where you would go in a dictionary to define the word hero if John McCain weren't part of that definition. He's a man who is admired by all. I remember when I first met John McCain. I was a newly sworn in senator, and I have three older brothers. Uh, they all served in the military. The oldest one flew B-52s for 20 years, and he thinks the coolest thing about his baby sister being a senator is that I might have a chance to say hello to John McCain. So um, I got a meeting set up in John McCain's office, and the first thing I did was sit down and tell him about my oldest brother, Don Reed, and what he'd done, and he talked about his flying. I had a second goal in mind when I met John McCain, and that was to pitch him on a Glass-Steagall bill, separating, boring, savings and loan, uh, uh, to pitch him on a Glass-Steagall bill, separating boring savings and checking accounts and that sort of banking from high-risk investment banking. It took him about 10 seconds to say, yeah, 
I'm in. We continue to introduce it, to fight for it. And John McCain teases me about it almost every time I see him. He says, why? Let's go down to the floor. Let's, let's raise a little hell over whether or not they can do this on banking. John McCain would just constantly tease me behind closed doors and frankly, not always behind closed doors, sometimes right out there in front of a bunch of people. And finally, Lindsay came over to me and he said, you know, Elizabeth, he said, John wouldn't tease you if he didn't like you. And I said, that's what my mother used to say about my three older brothers. And he said, well, you know, it's true. And I said, it didn't persuade me then. It doesn't persuade me now. But, but of course it does. He believes in what he believes in, and he's going to get in there and fight for it. I was standing at the desk. I, I just couldn't sit down. I was, I was too anxious and watching the votes. And so we had all the Democrats. That's 48. Susan Collins voted no. That gave us 49. Lisa Murkowski voted no. That gave us 50. Those were all the known commitments. And you're looking around it. Is there anybody else who might vote to save health care for all of these families? Where's John McCain? And he rounds the corner. Oh, I remember standing there watching. And he comes around that corner, no fuss, no must, and wait for his name again, and gives his iconic. And that's the moment. That's the moment when you know this is a man who voted not on party, but on principle. Well, he's pretty much the John McCain you see on, on camera. He's, though, really funny. And he's a naturalist. I mean, I don't think people realize this, but he'll walk around and name all of the birds on the property and, and uh, the, the trees and all of that. I would have never expected that from John McCain, but you know, he, he seems genuinely interested in all of those things. And I remember Secretary Clinton came out uh, as, a, uh, as one of the guests and one of the participants in this security conference. And I remember him walking her all around the, the ranch and the creek and all of that, pointing out uh, uh, different types of species and their nests and all of that. So um, he's a naturalist in a real way. Well, he's a force of nature, right? I mean, he's, um, he definitely wants his voice heard and speaks it very strongly. Obviously, he's so uh, believing in American values around the world, and he believes in the greatness of our nation and uh, the goodness that is, uh, you know, projected to the world when we're involved in things. You know, uh, there are many different sides to him, but uh, the side that America was introduced to him through, uh, being a patriot, uh, being someone who cares deeply about our men, men and women in uniform, making sure they have what it is they need, um, uh, that's just, that's John McCain. And um, he's fought hard and well and uh, is respected immensely on both sides of the aisle. When uh, Senator John McCain comes to a meeting, they know somebody has showed up. Uh, he uh, is a, a, a formidable figure, respected uh, globally and even across the aisle and across the Capitol. One of my first interactions with Senator McCain is when he had a hold on my Presidio bill in the Senate, and uh, he was very firm about keeping the hold, so I had to wait until another Congress to pass my bill. But the first uh, very positive uh, interaction was when I became whip, my first legislative uh, task was to get McCain Feingold passed through the House. The word I would use about him, whether it's professionally or personally or politically, is integrity. Uh, so uh, when he says something to you, even in humor or this or that, you know uh, that it has integrity. Uh, it brings great wisdom uh, to the, the conversation and sometimes great humor. And his commitment to our men and women in uniform into our armed services writ large over time is one that, of course, is in his family, this family tradition. His commitment to uh, our men and women in uniform is across the board, whether it's to make sure they had what they need uh, in terms of support, moral support, all the rest, but also uh, that they have what they need to keep us safe as well as themselves safe as they protect America. Uh, but it also goes to when they come home uh, that, that, that our veterans are cared for, and he has made a big commitment to that, as you know.